to write a, write a something for, a, for, a, for an occasional paper. And he has, before and since, occupied a very unique and very important space between policymakers, academia, and think tanks. And basically taking the ideas of people who are in the ideas business to policymakers and bringing the realities of policymakers to the people who are supposed to be thinking about novel interesting ideas. Since 2012, Antonio has been the director of the uh, EUISS, um, and without, uh, without any, anything other than great respect for his predecessors, he really has taken that institute to a whole different level uh, over the last number of years, and has developed a team of quite extraordinary young researchers and analysts within the EUISS, and has brought the EUISS, I think, really much more focused into the, into the central policy-making conversations in Brussels uh, and elsewhere. So, as I say, it's a delight to have him uh, with us, both personally and professionally. He's going to speak to us on European security and defense. So, without further ado, Antonio, you're very, very welcome. Thank you so much, Ben, and many, many thanks to the, the Institute for um, this invitation and this opportunity to come back to Dublin. I was here a few months ago in the context of the outreach and consultation process for the EU Global Strategy, uh, and I'm delighted to be back after the Global Strategy has been uh, delivered. Um, it is an opportunity, but it is also a challenge because talking defense in Dublin is always a very, very, very sensitive uh, uh, thing to do. And I will try to uh, live up to the challenge by trying to convey to you, um, honestly and candidly, a sort of insider's view of um, why and how defense is back on the agenda and even to some extent on top of the EU agenda, uh, at least for the forthcoming weeks. As you may remember, uh, allow me to recap very, very quickly. Uh, it uh, came up in uh, uh, December 2013 after a few years of absence. There was a European Council meeting devoted almost exclusively uh, to defense issues. And in, on that occasion, the Council uh, conferred the mandate to the High Representative to come up with a sort of strategic assessment of how the world had changed since 2003. Uh, the assessment was delivered in June 2015. It is the famous paper on the three C's, so to speak. The world has become more connected, more contested, and more complex. And it was a sort of uh, way of uh, redrawing, to some extent, the, the, the map of the world around the European Union and to redefine the role that the European Union could play in that particular world. And on the basis of that uh, assessment, the High Representative, now uh, Federica Mogherini, was conferred another mandate to come up with a global strategy for uh, European security and defense policy. Uh, for roughly one year, uh, there was a large consultation process uh, across the European Union in Brussels with points of contact that led to the preparation of a new text. Uh, it was an exercise that didn't take place in a vacuum, as you may all remember. The period between June 2015 and last June was quite uh, uh, interesting in Chinese terms. There was the migration crisis, uh, the terrorist attacks in Paris, Brussels, and more recently in Nice. Uh, and therefore, all these factors played a role in the, in the preparation of the global strategy. But certainly, the, the, the culmination of the process was last June, because the summit, when the global strategy was expected to be presented, uh, took place three days after the referendum in the UK. Initially, you may remember, uh, there was even a basically the same date for both the summit and the referendum, because London decided to hold it on the 23rd of June. And uh, Federica Mogherini likes to, to tell people privately the joke whereby Philip Hammond uh, called and said, Federica, I now realize that you have set up a meeting of the European Council on the same day as a referendum, which, of course, was a typical case of fog in the channel continent isolated, because the date for the summit had been decided long in advance. It was the date for the referendum that was set on the same day. Then, wisely, the... Uh, the date for the summit was postponed by a few days, but there was a big shock of Brexit on the 23rd of June, uh, or the morning on the 24th, and uh, on that occasion, single-mindedly, the High Representative decided to go ahead with the global strategy, although in the initial negotiations, the decision was not to proceed with it. Uh, you may adjust that as you like. I personally believe that it is uh, better to have the strategy uh, presented at the European Council. The, the strategy was presented during a very, very tense meeting of the heads of state and government with David Cameron notifying the, the, res, the result of the referendum. And the summit took uh, note of the, of the text and welcomed the presentation. That is the jargon that was used on that occasion. Uh, and what next, of course? Uh, first of all, let me say that 
The global strategy is not an official document in the traditional sense of the term by the EU, uh, in the sense that it has not been formally endorsed by all the member states at the level of co repair or political and security committee. But I can tell you from inside that the text has been somewhat negotiated, that there has been an effort in, uh, in uh, informal contacts with the foreign ministers of all the 28 member states, including the UK, uh, to uh, have a text that would not be unacceptable to anyone. Hmm? Let me put it this way. Not agreed word by word, but there was nothing in the text that would have uh, immediately raised uh, a rejection on the part of any single member state. The price to pay for that is that perhaps the text is a bit long hmm? uh, and drawn out. Uh, that was a sort of effect of adding uh, one point that was dear to one member state or the other, but there was an effort to make it as consensual as possible. What next? Uh, the High Representative in September at the Gimnik uh, meeting, the informal meeting of Foreign Minister, presented a sort of a roadmap for the implementation of the global strategy uh, that includes at least three or four elements, so to speak. One is uh, to um, uh, deepen uh, our understanding of uh, what actually a joined up approach to conflicts and crises should be and what different instruments at the EU level and uh, at the member states level should be brought to bear in that context. A second uh, um, strand is the so-called internal-external nexus. It is quite evident that our internal security depends on what happens outside and that it is uh, to some extent inevitable that if you combine the issues related to migrations and the issues related to terrorism, there is a problem there eh? and also of different jurisdictions that have to be called upon in order to act uh, collectively. A third strand is about updating the existing strategies of the EU in light of the new global strategy. Uh, I think that a new uh, strategy on Afghanistan is about to come out in a few days' time uh, and similarly other efforts will be made in order to, to work in that field. But perhaps the most important strand is precisely the one we are going to discuss today, that is security and defense. And there is a sort of implementation plan. It has been defined like that on security and defense. There has been a, a, an interesting debate over the summer. You may have uh, followed uh, uh, the presentation of papers, or rather known papers, by some member states. There was a Franco-German paper that was made public uh, uh, right before the meeting in Bratislava that starts from the assumption that at some stage we will proceed at 27. I mean, the, the starting point is a EU at 27, after Brexit. There is a, a, an Italian paper that was delivered more or less around the same time, and there is a Finnish paper. And right after that, the High Representative decided to circulate among all the member states a sort of questionnaire, a catalog of uh, ideas uh, to be discussed, um, in which the member states are expected to give uh, a response. I think the, the responses are due uh, as we speak these days. Uh, and then the, the, the high representative will collect uh, the, 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 the main changes coming from, from the member state. In the global strategy, defense is never framed or addressed as a standalone policy. It is always presented as part and parcel, as an ingredient, uh, in a broader approach, policy approach to external relations or the internal-external nexus. Uh, and in particular, there is a lot of emphasis on the new threats, hybrid threats, uh, that call into question the traditional uh, separation between what is internal and what is, is external. But the implementation plan is also an opportunity uh, to tackle some issues in this field that have remained stuck for years, in part uh, because of the attitude of the UK that was not particularly um, favorable to discussing uh, significant progress in the field of defense at the EU level, and in part also for a sort of lack of willingness or interest on the part of many other member states to address these issues. What has changed since? Well, the first is, as I said, uh, the prospect of a new European Union at 27. Hmm? And as I said, the Franco-German paper starts exactly from that uh, assumption. The American attitude has also changed over the past few years. You don't hear much noise coming from Washington and across the Atlantic, not even from NATO, about the risk of uh, duplication or, or competition with NATO in that particular respect. There is a sort of very pragmatic attitude whereby whatever works, uh, you remember Bill Clinton, whatever works in order to achieve results, to increase the Europeans' ability to take over more responsibilities, especially in the neighboring areas of, of, uh, of, uh, <coughs> of Europe. And last but not least, 
there is a readiness on the part of the European Commission to play ball. The European Commission for a number of years has been quite uh, uh, restrictive in what uh, it could uh, do in that particular field, what resources it could put at the disposal of the member states. Now, due to the different uh, strategic context, there is a, 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 a much more constructive and pragmatic attitude on the part of the Commission. So the questionnaire that has been distributed and is being compiled uh, is a way to give the member states uh, not only the last but also the first word uh, on what can be done collectively as you in this field. In the assumption that the EU as such could provide to some extent added value to what can be done. That through the EU framework things can be done that wouldn't be done otherwise at the purely national or even for the countries affected by that in the NATO context. Precisely because the EU is not just a political military alliance huh? and it is a community of countries that share much more than just uh, uh, security and can also mobilize other resources on the financial and the institutional side. Let me give you a, a few examples of what is already in the pipeline to this aspect, in this respect. As you probably know, there is already a preparatory action launched initially by the European Parliament and then approved uh, uh, by the Commission on defense-related research. That is something for the medium-long term but it is something for which a budget has been allocated until 2020, and there is the prospect of having an even stronger budget in the next multi-annual financial mm -hmm. framework. There is a readiness on the part of the Commission to disburse money for so-called capacity building in third countries. Well, all the, the activities and operations that the European Union has carried out, also with Irish participation, in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, uh, there has always been a shortage of resources, and even the training could not be followed up and complemented with uh, equipment and equipping uh, military and police forces over there. There is a readiness on the part of the Commission to use part, part of the development package uh, in order to support those efforts on certain conditions. There is a readiness on the part of the European Investment Bank to free up loans in order to permit investment uh, on uh, defense research and development to that effect. The European Investment Bank is a EU institution but is not part of the traditional framework of uh, EU institutions. There is an idea of providing direct funding from the Commission for some types of equipment, for instance satellite imagery or maritime capabilities that could also be brought to use uh, by the European Union. And last but not least, but this is still far from being agreed upon, there's a possibility of some tax breaks for those forms of investments on cooperative projects between and among member states uh, that could create common capabilities. Huh? That is something that could be, to some extent, that is a request coming from my own country in particular, discounted huh, from uh, the, the, the stability pact huh, in order to allow for more investment in that field. And last but not least, there is a, a, a determination to review the so-called Athena mechanisms that uh, govern the way in which military operations are funded by the European Union, by adding uh, deployment costs, by adding some of the equipment that is involved in there, in order to take away part of the burden from the member states that participate in those operations. Among the other issues that are on the agenda is a different framework for the use of the so-called battle groups, also Ireland is in involved in that. It is in part about the funding, it is in part about giving them a sort of uh, more permanent uh, hub in Brussels that could help uh, deploying uh, the battle groups whenever necessary. There is an idea that has been uh, put in the questionnaire about creating a sort of joint civil military planning and conduct facility uh, in Brussels in order to create an additional layer that would permit the operational commanders to liaise uh, with uh, Brussels when that is uh, required. There is a request to improve uh, the, the, the rules and the procedures for force generation for civilian uh, uh, crisis management. There has been a shortage of adequate resources in there and uh, the, the, the game between the Commission and the Member States could be improved in that particular respect. And that has been very much in the headlines. There has been a discussion on the extent to which some uh, articles in the treaty that have not been used so far uh, can be activated uh, and, and brought to bear. One is Article 44 that basically permits a group of member states to be mandated to carry out mm, an activity on behalf of the European Union. And the other one is Article 46 about the so-called permanent structure cooperation uh, among a, a group of member states that could uh, um, uh, operate jointly also with the EU resources. 
All this uh, hints at the so-called level of ambition, which is, uh, to some extent, the common thread in the current uh, uh, discussion among the member states, that is, what are the types of capabilities that would uh, um, allow for an appropriate level of strategic autonomy for the EU in order to be able to carry out certain activities, even when uh, NATO is not on board hmm, and a single member state is not willing already to carry out those activities by itself. Uh, as I said, the questionnaire, uh, once all the answers are collected, is meant to ascertain and assess what the member states are ready to do or not at 28, at 27, and at less than 27 if that is the case. Um, my understanding is that our representative will try nevertheless to be ambitious and to come up with a package that is as inclusive as possible, uh, capable of covering uh, demands coming from different member states, also demands that apparently may not go in the same direction. With the view to having a few quick deliverables already by the end of the year, that could be put in place uh, before the end of the, uh, the term of the current institution in 2019, but also putting in perspective a number of uh, measures and resources uh, that could uh, help generate uh, additional capabilities in the medium to long term. Uh, that will be probably after Brexit uh, and uh, in the next multilateral uh, financial framework. Let me conclude by raising the political question. Why this hurry? Why is it that suddenly, after Brexit, there is such a pressure to, to deliver on security and defense? Uh, the High Representative says that there is a window of opportunity and there is also a window of urgency in this respect. First of all, the demand for security is very widespread across the European Union. And of course, one of the challenges is that the drivers or the ingredients of the demand are not the same all across the European Union. They are very different in, uh, in Tallinn uh, and in Dublin. They are very different in Cologne and in Paris. They are very different in Brussels and in Athens. And of course, the task of political leaders is to try to bring together different strands in order to come up with a credible and shareable package to that effect. Um, there is also language in the global strategy that to some extent raises uh, this issue when it says that the European Union has a duty to protect its citizens and to deter threats. Mm? That is language that is new and goes beyond CSDP as we know it. CSDP has been for a number of years basically about acting outside the European Union uh, in order to promote peace and, and, and build the peace uh, uh, across the world. So the demand is there and has to be met. It's also a way of proving the, um, the added value and the usefulness of the European Union, and we have to respond. Also, if I may put it this way, acting on security and defense is the area in which uh, it is more likely uh, to, to exist uh, a consensus among the member states. On other policy areas, migration, the stability pact, uh, positions are still divergent among the member states. Whereas here, due to the particular strategic context, there is a possibility to show determination and to show that the European Union matters. And of course, the urgency is due to the political agenda next year. If you look at what is in the pipeline next year, you have uh, French elections, first presidential and then parliamentary elections from uh, March, April, Dutch elections in May, and German elections in September. These are three founding member states of the European Union. Two of them are certainly core members, but I would say that also in this respect, the, the, the Netherlands is no less important. And there is a lot of uncertainty about the outcome of those elections. At the end of the year, we may end up with a different set of leaders across the European Union. And this element of uncertainty makes it all the more necessary to reach some sort of agreement, at least uh, on, on the way ahead uh, before the end uh, of the year. So December, in many respects, is the real deadline, although there is a a frequent reference to um, March, the 60th anniversary of the Rome Treaty, as a sort of a ceremonial uh, moment at which uh, some ideas can be put on the table. But March will already be a few weeks before the presidential elections in France. So I suspect that uh, December is the real deadline. And what about Ireland? Hmm? For the little knowledge I have, uh, security and defense is a very sensitive policy area in this country. The country is probably in a slightly complicated political phase uh, with a minority government in that respect, but it also has 
legal and institutional safeguards in the treaties. Mm? Uh, I've read the, 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 the press recently, and there is a lot of fear of being uh, marginalized or being outvoted. There are many, many, many safeguards in the treaties. So I, I think that that is probably a fear that is to some extent overstated. I would say, if I may, that the most important thing would be to have a cooperative approach in which Ireland articulates its needs and its demands. That should not be only negative demands about what you should not do, uh, but also what the European Union could do and what Ireland would contribute to in this particular respect in order to allow uh, the High Representative to come up with a package that is more acceptable to everyone. A specific challenge for everybody in Ireland and in Brussels will be to find language in presenting these ideas that speaks to, to the people in the streets, that is not too technical, but conveys the right ideas and the right messages. Unfortunately, the debate in Europe uh, and on Europe on, regarding security and defense has been hijacked for decades by terms like Euro Army, permanent headquarters, and application. That is not what we are discussing right now. Huh? But unfortunately, very often these terms come back to haunt us and make it even more difficult to find those pragmatic and, and feasible arrangements that uh, the high representative in particular would like to be able to deliver by the end of the year.